Hello again. Thanks for clicking on to Jiffy and Stubbsy. This is Series 2. It's underway. Uh, dual code uh, rugby league, rugby union star Jonathan Davis came up with the idea that we should uh, sit down and chat to people from the world of sport about all manner of things. Asked me to join in and uh, of course I was delighted to do so. So this is Series 2. In, in Series 1 we were joined by the likes of Siri and Botham, uh, wool skipper Connor Cody, Lions coach uh, Graham Roundtree, Tour de France winner Geraint Thomas, and those podcasts are still available to click onto now. Grateful thanks to Kerry London, who have agreed to sponsor this second series. Uh, thank you very much to Kerry for that. We're in uncertain times in regard to financial situations, and Kerry are a company you could turn to for all aspects of uh, insurance. So here we go. Jiffy's in South Wales. I'm in South West London. Um, what a guest we have joining us today from his home in Shanghai. Carlton Palmer, England international, played for Carlton. Have I got this right? West Bromwich Albion, Sheffield Wednesday, Leeds, Southampton, Forest, Coventry, few moors. You had a spell as a manager. And I think I'm right. First of all, you told me over a drink one day, you were voted player of the season by the fans in just about every club you played for. And I would say that is a great honour for the fans of every club you played for to say you were the top player of the season. I think that's a great honour. Thanks very much, Stubbsy. Hope you're well. Nice to speak to you all from Shanghai. Yeah. Am I right, by the way? Did you win that award of all those clubs? All those clubs, yeah. 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 That that's a brilliant. That's a that's a brilliant accolade, really. Because when you go, because when you go to different clubs, first thing you got to do is well, you got to prove yourself to the changing room, and then also then you know you got to get the fans on board. And uh, it's uh, it's very difficult sometimes when you're coming from um, kind of rival teams. But uh, that's that's a, that's a good that's a good thing to do. And then you can always you know leaving clubs with, um, with when you don't burn any bridges as well. So that's a, that's a brilliant accolade. Fair play, Carlton. Carlton, how would you describe yourself as a player? See, it's, it's difficult, you see, because I, I, I was brought up from, with Ron Atkinson from a very young age. And Ron's opinion was that it's the fans who pay your wages. So he wanted us to play in a way that entertained the supporters. Um, and so I fitted into that with every, every game I played, for every club I played, I always gave uh, 110%. And so I think the, the fans really took to that, especially, you know, I, I played at Sheffield Wednesday for nine years, Northern people, I played at Leeds United for how many years? And, and they know how hard, it, you know, it is to work and earn money. Um, my first season down in Southampton, um, you know, I, I've, I've just been lucky really, but I, I do work extremely hard. Uh, and it, and if you describe what would I describe myself? Uh, I'm 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 one of these. Um, I'm I would be an olden day James Milner. <laughs> so, but, hey, but there's no there's there's no like secret recipe, is it, Carl? Everyone says, oh yeah, this and training techniques and everything. whatever you do, whatever you know, walk of life it is, it's hard work. You know, that's, that's, it comes down to that. You work hard at your job, right? And you're going to get better at it. And people are going to respect you for it. Sometimes you won't play well, but if you put the effort in, those people appreciate it. And I think that's, that's really important. I totally agree with that. In every walk of life. I mean, my missus is always telling me that everything I, I, I make a reference to football, but life is like football. I'm like that with my kids. I talk about that. You know, you know that in sport. You can start the game off, you could be having a nightmare, but you can finish the game off and you can turn it into a good game. You could be losing, you could win. You have your ups, you have your downs, you have your good times, you have your bad times. And it's just about top players. It's about finding, well, what top players do, first and foremost, top players go beyond the call of duty and they find what's necessary to be the best. Uh, and, and that takes a different mindset. Um, and, 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 and that's w when you become an international um, because, you, because you have that, that level. Um, you know, and funny enough, I, I was speaking to Big Ron about the boy Jack Grealish at Villa, where, you know, 
and 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 they were talking about Grealish and Deli Ali and 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 you know whilst they are talented players and you'll know this Jonathan talented players don't always get teams or or countries to where they need to be you've got yeah. to have that balance between talent and and the and well, well, put it this way, Ronaldo and Messi aren't the two best players in the world and haven't been for the last 10 years just based on talent. No, and I think that's a point because what you do is, you know, even if you've got a, a, kind of a superstar in your team, you know, he does the same as everyone else. And when the time is needed, that superstar steps out above and beyond that team environment. And that's why you buy kind of marquee players. It's that because you know... When everyone's pulling together and you need something special, that's why he gets paid that much money, the marquee player, because he can do something. But I just, I, I'm the same. You say that sport and life is you know, is very parallel, and it is. And I think society, you know, is is different. You know, I grew up in 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 a rugby environment, in a sporting environment. You learn to to work hard. You know, you get your knocks. You got to bounce back from your knocks. There's a lot of, you know, talk about um, mental toughness and uh, and mental health. But this all kind of, you develop this naturally in a sporting environment. And you have, you know, sometimes, I hear someone say last week, when, when, when their kids come home and they come 25th in the race in school and they have a medal, you're thinking, well, you know, yeah, that's a participation medal. Perhaps you can have that. But ultimately, life is about achieving goals, winning and losing. And, you, and you're going to win and lose in anything that you do. And in, in sport, it's, diff- it's different because you're doing it in the public eye and that's where the pressure comes. So, you know, I, I, how did you find the, you know, the transition? You go back to your sport in Korea. Like, how do you find the transition then from, because this is very topical at the moment, from finishing your footballing career, Carlton, and then going you know, into management and then into you know, explaining to people what you're doing now? Well, the, the difference with me is I, I was always making plans for yeah. after football. I, I was looking to have to people around me to talk to me properly, you know, about money and about other things. Because as a sportsman, you retired at a very young age. Yeah. I retired on my terms. I still had two years left on my, my contract at Coventry when I decided to, to, to give up playing in the Premier League. Um, because I played so long, but because I was into other things, I had my own restaurants, I was into TV, I was into other things. Um, and... So I think that the key is to plan. You know, if you don't plan, I mean, I see Scolzi's getting divorced the other day and I'm sure without trying to be clever about it, I think Scholes is in that mid-water where he's finished playing. He's been an elite player. He's not gone into management. He's not really uh, into the TV as such, does a little bit here and there, and he's not really committed to anything. Whereas I was always planning for the next step, for the next step. And then I've, I've been fortunate in, in dropping into things like, so when I, when I didn't progress with the, the BBC and I went to Dubai to do the TV work, I ended up working in, in a school doing the coaching and whatever. And that was the best thing that happen, happened to me because yeah. then I've ended up in Shanghai, you know, coaching in schools, which is, which is fantastic. And it's just kept me busy. Do you think that you're? Uh, hang on, like, can I get a point? Do you think you were a better player and a better person for having outside interests? Uh, well, I've got to be honest with you. When I was playing football, I was consumed by it. Yeah, I was consumed by it. I was consumed by wanting to be the best and wanting to win. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm also the type of person that also understands that everything runs it runs by its sell by date. And what I didn't want to, I I think what's been more important for me is to have good people around me. I've been lucky, you know, I've had good role models like, you know, in Ron, in Howard Wilkinson, in Gary McAllister, in Ian Rush and people uh, who've always, so I I was never, you know, I'm not, I'll be honest with you. And and this is God's honest truth in what what I've been retired, 15 years. I think there's only one time in that 15 years I've wished I'd I've, I've gone back and played football and that's when I took uh, Jordan to watch Aston Villa in the cup final. And that was only because I was invited to the team hotel and I, was, I, w- I had lunch with them. And, and obviously, big games, you start getting that feeling and you go to yeah. Wembley. Other than that, I, I, I really 
haven't missed it. I, I, I love the game of football, but I, I, I also knew that it comes a time. And you know, when you're getting older, that you can't play the way that you wanted to play. So you start getting frustrated with your teammates. You start getting frustrated with yourself. And that's when it's time to get out, which is what I did. I was fortunate enough then to, to go into management. But even yeah. then, because of the way things have changed now, I resigned from Mans- Mansfield and then went on to do other things that I had interest in. So I've, I've been very, very lucky like that. And I've been very busy. I have not had, I can't, I, I can't say I've, I've not done anything for three months. And I've got to be honest with you, I've got two years left on my contract out here. And Stubbsy, you know the crack. I'm looking forward to going down to Portugal and moving down there with Lucy. <laughs> now, you mentioned before the pair of you about you've both got a great link with grassroots sport. And, and that leads me to ask, with the financial problems that smaller football clubs, rugby clubs, a level of cricket clubs, with the financial problems they're going to be facing uh, at the moment, in football terms, Carlton, is it time for the Premier League to assist those clubs and make sure they don't go to the wall? What's the answer? Well, do you know what? The coronavirus is and the pandemic, it's been absolutely terrible. Um, and, you know, my wife's lost a, a, a grandfather to the coronavirus and we weren't able to get back to the funeral. But the one thing that's happening and will happen will be a realignment in everything. And that includes sport, sport, especially football. Um, and, and, and don't say it doesn't happen in the lower leagues. I've seen it in non-league. I've seen it in the lower leagues where the clubs spend money on players, on salaries yeah. that they can't afford. There's yeah. going to be a requirement. Yes, there has to be help from the Premier League because there's a lot of money washed there. But listen, the Premier League clubs are struggling. I think it was come out the other day, Arsenal have 200 million from the coronavirus with the, the lack of crowds and, 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 and so forth. But they still are going to... It may be the Premier League clubs, it may be the government, but they're going to help, have to help out the lower league clubs. But also, there has to be a realignment in salaries. Clubs yeah. need... To run. I mean, I was manager of Stockport, so I can tell you the chairman who was manager of Stockport at the time, Brendan Elwood, was a wealthy owner. The club wasn't run on a, on a, on a sound financial footing. It was run on the basis of him putting in 750 grand every six months. Yeah, and that's it. That's the same with sport. You look at all every sport; they've got benefactors, and if they turn, you know, their back on on their clubs or the games, and this is with Carlton, all the local rugby clubs with rugby union, it has to it has to be prioritised international rugby because international rugby is where the money is, and then they filter down. If it's not international rugby, then the money kind of you know doesn't filter down, and that's a difficult thing. And also, no, they will. They'll have to have a restart by saying all these local clubs with the benefactor coming in and going, oh yeah, we'll give, we'll give that player £200 a week, we'll give that player £200 a week. This is an opportunity now for those clubs. There's professional, there's amateur. Anything below the professional uh, line, you don't pay anyone. But you, you, you get benefactors paying players. So I think it's going to be very, very difficult. Um, but hopefully, you know, my little club, Trimsara, they'll... The sponsors will keep doing things and the, the boys, you know, will go and, and support the club. But it is, it is going to be difficult, but it's difficult for, for everyone, you know, in, in all walks of life. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's still going to be a tough, tough three, six months again. Carlton, from, from uh, club sports to international sport, are China going to qualify for the 2022 World Cup? I was looking at the qualifying groups. I think it starts up again soon. Now, my understanding is the Chinese government said it was a, a strategy that the country was going to become very good at football. So I would suggest if the government says that's going to happen, they want that to happen, it will happen. Are they making progress? Yeah, but it's, it's going to take a long time, Ray. I mean, we, we, you're talking now, it was only compulsory uh, two and a half years ago to play football in the schools. Only compulsory two and a half years yeah. ago. Um, so it's going to take a long time. What they have done, and they've done it quickly. So when I first came out here, the Chinese league was playing huge sums of money and bringing out just every name. They've now capped that now. So every club's capped. They've got um, under 21, one under 21 player has to play. They've got their local players in. 
what they're doing is bringing coaches in from abroad. So I think they've learned from the way that America first went at the MLS and they've got the infrastructure in place. I think 2022 might be too soon, but let me tell you, whatever China decides to uh, put their mind to, they certainly have the um, resources and money to do it. They will do. What about you know the level of the of the football? So the top the top league in in China now, because you've heard you know like the, the names of Bandar Abir was going to go there, and every top player was going to go there. What level is the top top league over there? You know, compared to the to the English leagues, where are they? It's poor. I mean, uh, it, it, to be honest with you, I it, you know I'm not knocking players. Um, no. You know, listen, but I do not understand, and I'll be truthful with you, I, did, I tell Oscar to his face, he's Oscar he, he, from Chelsea, he's 24 years of age, he's missed out on a World Cup, he's on 600 grand a week, but he was on 130 grand a week at Chelsea, but now he's not playing. I don't get that, and he comes from a rich family. He's not like he comes from a poor family. If I speak to the likes of Hulk, Hulk comes from a poor family, he's doing what he's doing to help his family. I can understand the likes of uh, Cavallo coming out for a season at the end of his career. I don't yeah. understand young players coming to the league because it's not established yet. And, and, and the standard is, you know, it, it, I would say, I w- I, I'd say that it, w- it wouldn't be no more than the first division. It's certain they, they, they'd struggle yeah. in the championship, that's for sure. Yeah, but it's a great point, you know, you're making, uh, I think that, I look at players now and they're going to, you know, they go over to China. And I agree with you. In this pandemic now, it just shows how important in, in front of crowds are. Because as a footballer, as a sportsman, that's what you want to do. The money is, is a bonus, really. And I think, you know, the more you get, the, you know, the more comfortable you are. But, you know, to go from top leagues over here or in Europe and to play in China, when you've got something, I think, like you said, a good point you made, Kat, uh, was the fact that you played a long, long time. So when you came to the end, you knew. Yeah, that's it. I can call it a day. A lot of players, they don't play enough. Then they make a couple of wrong decisions in all sports. And then when they finish, you know, they say, oh, they've got mental health issues. And I think it's a lack of preparation and a lack of participation when you are playing because you've, you think you haven't done enough when you could. Yeah, I know. I, I, just, I just don't get it how you would leave. The Premier League no, me. is the... Don't. Me, it's the top league in the world, and you, you know. Let me let's be honest with you. You're not. You're not. Lead, you're not. If you're a top player in the Premier League now, you know you're earning over two hundred thousand pound a week. Plus, you're not going to not going to finish the game if you're playing for ten years without being skinned. The game to me is like this, and I remember Ian Rush saying to me this: Concentrate on your football. If you're good enough, son, the money will come. Yeah. Yeah, simple. And, that's, simple. And, and that's in every walk of life. If you're the best at what you're doing, the byproduct is money. So what do you denote when you finish the game of football or the game of rugby or whatever sport you finish? Do, do, do you denote it by how many millions you got? Or do you denote it by uh, the, the... The first thing I did, Chris Waddle, when he signed from Marseille uh, to Sheffield Wednesday, and uh, I, I'm a massive Chris Waddle fan, and I went round to his house, and he's got plenty of money. But do you know what the best thing was when I was, went into his, his, his trophy room? Player of the Year award in France, Sports Writers Player of the Year, 69 England caps, FA Cup, Champions League, all of these medals that he's won. That's what it's about. And the, the, the byproduct of that success yeah. is the, comes the financials. So, and it's still today, you in the, in, in the Premier League, you look at the boys who, de- who are motivated, the Kevin De Bruyne's on 300 grand a week. They're motivated to do. Somebody said to me, uh, an agent said to me the other day, we we're talking about Deli Alley. And an agent said to me, it's Mourinho's job to motivate Deli Alley. How's it Mourinho's yeah. job to motivate Deli Alley? He's on good, he's on top money. He, wa- he should want to motivate himself to be better at Spurs and want to motivate himself to be better to play for England. And Josie Mourinho, whether you like him or hate him, has proven he's a manager who wins trophies. Carlton, you mentioned yeah. Deli Alley before, and um, you mentioned Deli Alley and you mentioned Grealish. How good are these young players? They're talented, but that's, 
I, I remember uh, Jack Grealish in particular. I don't know the boy Deli Ali from a young age, but I, I know I know Jack Grealish. I've seen him when he was playing for the kids in Hong Kong, right? In the Hong Kong Sevens years ago. And I remember seeing him and, and he stood out then. He stood out as a talented player, right? But there's always been a question mark even then when I've watched him. He, he played when he had the ball. I watch him now at Aston Villa where everybody's talking about him. And, and by the way, I'm not knocking the kid, he's talented. But they finished on the last day of the season, staying up in the Premier League. So I ask you the question, would, apart from Man United, any of the top five teams touch him? He wouldn't go to Chelsea. He wouldn't go to a Man United. Uh, well, sorry, Man United probably the only one. He wouldn't get in a Liverpool side. He wouldn't get in an Arsenal side. Yet, Aston Villa have just given him 35 million for the next five years. <laughs> and Why would it. you move? Why would you move? Well, if someone gave well, him a chance, in the, if he played in those top teams, Carlton, wouldn't he then, would he then train on, as they say? No. He's 25 years of age now, right? He's, he's, he's 25 years of age, right? Now, at 25 years of age, you'd, I'd look at him now. Would I even see him getting into the Leicester team? Would you swap him for the boy Madison? I wouldn't. Uh, you know, and because you've got, to, you've got to understand, Mourinho, I see Mourinho talking to Deli Alli, and he sees what he offers the team on the ball. He sees what he offers the team in scoring goals. But he points out what he doesn't offer the team when they lose the ball. To be in the top four, to compete to win Champions League, to compete to win trophies, you, you've got to work both ways. Now, maybe Jack Grealish might be able to do that in a better side. But if he can't do it in an Aston Villa side, how's he going to do it in a top side? It, it's, it's, it's difficult. So, uh, as Aston Villa... Why would he sign again for Aston Villa? Because why wouldn't it? Not because if, 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 if Aston Villa finish, say, ninth or tenth in the league this season, right? That's about, I think, where he, he might get in the top eight or seven tied. You're looking at, would Wolves sign him? I don't know. Because Wolves play an high energy game. Yeah. You know, it, it, you've got to go and close that ball down. The way these top teams want to play, that when they lose the ball, they want to get the ball back. And so you've got to offer, if you're a, if you're a talented player, you've got, to, you've, you, you, you've got to offer something to the team when you're out of possession. And neither Deli Alli nor uh, Grealish do that. And that's why Deli Alli is struggling to get in the Tottenham side now and the England side. Yeah. Uh, Carlton, we lost Graham Taylor too soon. Can you describe the relationship that existed in the England dressing room when you became an international. There was always talk of the relationship between Graham and some of the senior England players. Can you put us right about that, please? Graham Taylor was just a victim of the time. You know what happens sometimes for a manager. When Alex Ferguson leaves United, whoever took over was going to be a victim because Alex Ferguson's a clever man. Alex Ferguson, the last time they won the league, drew every ounce out of that side. He left with a rebuilding job to do. It's a problem. So you imagine the England team now after 1990, the World Cup. You've got, you know, all your players finishing now. You've got Peter Beardsley finishing. You've got Mark Wright coming out. You've got Paul Parker coming out. You've got seven or eight of those players who are finishing now. It's a rebuilding job. When I got into the England side, you've got, when we went to Euro 92, I think it was eight players who on, in single figures in caps. So it, it, it was going to be difficult. It was going to take time. So, OK, Sweden, England, 1-1 one, one on the hour. England have to score. Yeah. Gary Lineker is substituted. Alan Smith is called for by England. And Gary Lineker is coming off. This is a sensation. Is Lineker leaving international football? He's obviously stunned by the decision. Tell me about that moment and what went through all your minds. Because Gary being substituted at that moment, 
that drew a gasp. Right decision, wrong decision. What were you thinking? And was there a big grab believe, afterwards? I believe, I believe that Graham made the decision because he thought it was the right decision. It was nothing personal to do with Gary. He made the decision, let me tell you, uh, and you, you can watch the game over and tell me if you think I'm right or wrong. Holland v England in Rotterdam to qualify the World Cup we should have been ahead in the game in the first half. I'm walking down the tunnel. He pulls me because I played on the right-hand side, that side. I, that side was quiet. We had no problem with the De Boer brothers that night, right? And he turned around to me and he said, Colton, we only needed a draw. He said to me, I think we can win the game. I'm going to put Andy Sinton up. Now, it's a decision he, he chose to make. I think it was wrong. He opened the game up. And once yeah. the game opened up, the one player needed on the pitch was somebody who could get around the pitch, and that was me. And they didn't have it. Okay, Kuhlman should have got sent off, and we should still have got the result to get us through. So I think he made a decision. If he actually thought about it in hindsight, he would have probably thought about it. His last, Gary's last game, um, you know, let him finish this out. Gary can score. Gary can be having a poor game. I played yeah. with Gary a lot of times for England. He can be having a poor game and if there's a chance comes, he'll take it. But I genuinely believe that Graham did what he did because he thought he could still win the football game. I honestly believe that. He's not that type of a bloke. So I think there was a bit of an issue between Graham and Gary about that. But, you know, that's what happens in, 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 when you're a manager. You have to make those decisions and you live and die by them. That's what he's paid to do, isn't it? Exactly, and if he does, Balance, if, you know, if, if he comes on and scores, he's the best. Yeah, if somebody had come ever. on and scored, if somebody had come on and scored, and we'd have got, uh, we'd have got through, nobody would have said anything, would they? It's only because we out. And but and by the way, it wasn't just that. I think the press had a, a vendetta against Graham Taylor. By this point, no matter what he did, apart from winning every game, it, they, they were always going to crucify him. You know, in the I mean, game against France. In the, game again, in the game against France, you played sweeper. You played sweeper yes. in the game against France. And I also read that was Lineker and Shearer up front together. There's a double act. And Cantona was in the French team. Were you anywhere near Eric? Yeah, we had, we had, uh, they had Cantona and Papin up front. And by the way, if you look at that game, the French game, this is how, this is how close it is to... Uh, the fine line between failure and success. In the first game against Denmark, it was a draw. I think that was a fair result, right? The second game, we deserved to win. The free kick that Piercy hits, that comes back off the post, hits the goalkeeper, tell me how that doesn't go in the net. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's unbelievable. It's, it's unbelievable. You know, Woodsy really doesn't have a save to make in the game. And then we, then we have to go into the last game needing, needing a win. But yeah, no, we changed the system. We played three, uh, three at the back, <laughs> and me and Martin Kian were were man market. Well, no, uh, actually, man, Martin Kian was man marking with Des Walker, and I played as the spare man at the back. And then the World Cup campaign, which you mentioned before, you mentioned there the sort of thin line between success and failure. I know you. If you would have gone to a World Cup campaign. I think that would have topped it for you. I think that would have been absolutely the pinnacle of your career. Well, that's, that's all I needed to do, right? To be honest with you, that's all I needed to do. I played in the FA Cup final, played in the League Cup final. I, I just needed to get to a World Cup. And that campaign, Ray, I've gone over it time and time again. And let me tell you, if somebody doesn't tell us, it's against us. What was happening, I'll tell you from the start of the campaign. They were going to do renovations at Wembley. So the talk was, we've got to play the first two games at home and then, and then the final two games away from home. That's the problem in its start. So we play Norway at, at home at Wembley, right? We weren't the better side, didn't deserve to lose. In extra time, the guy scores, if you remember, from about 35 yards, a screamer straight in the top corner. We then play Holland at Wembley. In the first half is probably the best performance of an England team that I've ever played in. We absolutely battered them. Should have been three or four up. 
Bergkamp scores an absolute wonder goal just before half time. But then after half time, Les Ferdinand gets brought down, should have been a penalty. Voters elbows, elbows Gascoigne, breaks his cheekbone, and Des pulls over Mars back outside the box. We end up drawing 2 2. And that's the way the campaign went. We just never got a break um, along the way, never got a break. And then you go to, I remember Graham talking to us before we went to Holland, and he said, We only needed a draw. And we all believed we would get it. I mean, you, you look at the circumstances in that game. The, the free kink that Kuhlman scores from should never have been retaken, but then was retaken before the whistle was blown. So David Seaman wasn't set. Kuhlman with the free kick for Holland. A vital moment as two sides look for a place in the World Cup finals. The first goal could be so vital. Is that wall lined up? Can Seaman get a side of it? Kuhlman with the shot, charged down by Ince. Bergkamp tries to get it in. I don't think... I think possibly Ince will get a yellow card because he was not within, he got within 10 yards, so Kuman gets a reprieve for the second time and gets another free kick, Ron. As a manager, you think that's brilliant defending from Ince. Ince is the charger, Ince has come out and blocked the shot out, full of bravery. Now he's been punished for it. So come on, England, let's see if we can hold it out again. Again, it's Ronald Kuman. Again, the problem is there. Again, it's a critical moment. He's going to flip one now. He's going to flip one. He's going to flip one. And it's in. We get a free kick at the other end, right? In see, um, we weren't allowed to retake the free kick. Tony Rigo, Rigo hits the post. Paul Merson hits the post. We, yeah. we should have won the game. Kuhlman should have got sent off. End of story. If it's not a penalty, he's the last man. He gets sent off. He gets sent off. 1-1, one, one, we're going to the World Cup, end the story. But that's, that's the campaign. So that's why I believe in life. I've always believed that if things are meant to be, they're meant to be. So it is what it was, and, and, and we move on from there. And, and it's amazing that Taylor Venables then takes, te- takes over. Everybody in that squad was picked for the first squad under Taylor Venables except for me. And I would probably have been Graham Taylor and in that campaign, one of the most probably successful players. And I never played for England again. Do you think a lot of, um, do you think a lot of England players um, are intimidated by the media uh, because they're, it's so kind of analysed and, and critical if things go badly, you know, managers, players... Do you think a lot of them are, whereas, you know, intimidated? Because a lot of other countries, when they play for their countries, it's, a, it's the greatest honour ever and they just go out there and play their best football. Whereas, I think a lot of the English players would have would feel intimidated with the pressure and rather play for their clubs than, than play for England. Not rather play, but maybe wrong, but there'd be less pressure. Well, the media play a big part. Yeah. Uh, that is sure. But also, they're very clever. Look at Gareth Southgate. No disrespect to Gareth Southgate, right? No disrespect to him at all. But he gets the England job. Euros, everybody's talking about great Euros. They only played one team. If you look at the qualifying round, what the teams they played were 50 and 60 in the world. But everybody said they only played one team against Croatia. They played Croatia after the Euros in a friendly and beat them with a system he should have played. And again, they love him, so they keep playing him. Look at the situation he did with Sterling when he left him out. He created more pressure. Look at the situation just with the two boys, Foden and the other boat. Both of their clubs have brought them back in and played. I just think it's the media and playing up to media. Yeah. So that England put Gareth Southgate in, who the media won in. He does everything then to please the media, as it were. I mean, two young lads stepped out of line, of course. Deal with them and get on and play and win the game. We've lost, we drew a game and, and, and lost the game because... He, he, he's taken two of the best players home, right? Mm. Two young lads showed a bit of indiscretion, you know, deal with them, let's go on with it. Sterling and the boy and Cuffs at dawn and you leave your best player out. But he only left him out because of the, the opposition they were facing. If they were play, facing a big side, he wouldn't have left him out. But that's what <laughs> I'm on about. 
Yeah, and if the media are on your side and the media are backing Gareth Southgate and saying all these things and lauding him, uh, I'm yet to be convinced by him. I like the fact that he's bringing in all these young players. I do. But the simple fact is for me, I, I'm, I'm a simple and I've been brought up by managers who've been very successful, who've won things. Defenders need to defend. Whether they can play with the football or not, they need to defend. In the game we lost against Croatia, we've got three um, centre-backs. We've got the boy Kale at Chelsea, who's voted in the top four players, best defenders in the Premier League that season, not even playing. The two goals come down the side of, uh, of John Stones and, 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 and your man Kyle Walker, who are not centre-backs. Carlton, let me go back on something. Did you ever ask Terry Venables why you weren't in that England squad? Because surely, surely you've had an opportunity down the years to say, why was I left out? Never asked him, but I knew Ron, Ron Atkinson told me before the squad were picked. Do you know what Ron said to me? You've got no chance of being picked for England because the media don't like you and Terry Venables is a media man. London Mafia, media. That's simple, isn't it? That's simple, eh? Simple. It's dead simple. Well, and don't get me wrong, I've, I, I've been out with, to drink with Terry Venables. He's a lovely bloke. I think from all, what all the lads say to me, he's a, he's, 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 he's a fantastic coach. He knows the game. But you see, if somebody is not... Like, it's amazing now, Ray. I, mo, it's amazing now. I, it seems that I'm more appreciated now than I'm retired than when I played the game. The things people come out and say, whether they're realising and seeing what's happening with their teams and realised what they did, but I'm more appreciated now than when I played. You never Carlton, have a bad game when you're retired, Carlton. Carlton. So, sorry, Jeff. Carlton, I have to say, I've been a member of that nasty media team for many, many years, so I can see both sides of this. All I would say is, I do think you have been very unfairly treated down the years. And um, I don't think that has ever been right. I'm pleased to hear you say now that you think you're getting more uh, acknowledgement for what you achieved uh, in latter years. But sometimes it did seem like a lot of people had it in for you. I never understood it. Well, Ray, you say one of, you're one of the nasty media ones. You weren't. You were a fair media one. And, and, and I know a lot of you who were like that. There was a lot of guys in the media that were, were fair who I would talk to. Um, but um, no, I mean, listen, for some reason, um, you know, I, I seem to, to, to be an easy target for the press. But you don't play as many games as I did in the top league and play for the clubs that I played for and did what I did if I was a poor player. And that's facts. So that was fine. They were allowed to get on and do what they want to do. I was disappointed. I went to Leeds United. The first season, we finished fifth in the Premier League. And I played well. I played really well. And not to get capped again was very disappointing. Um, but do you know what? I started off as a, as a, as a, a, a lad from Oldbury, Worley, West Midlands, wanting to play for West Bromwich Albion. And I did that. I went on to play 19 times from the country. So I didn't do too bad in the end. What's your, what's your favourite team you played for, Carl? Have you yeah. got a favourite team? I, honestly, Sheffield Wednesday. We still got our family home in Sheffield. I remember to this day, at the time, West Brom wanted to sell me. And uh, the London teams were after me. I actually had a long chat with Ken Bates about going to Chelsea. They just signed Dennis Wise and they, they were getting a hell of a team together. And I remember speaking to Nobby Stiles was, was at West Brom at the time. And I, and I said to Nobby, I sat down with Nobby. I said, what do you think, Nobby? He said, I'll tell you what you need to do, son. And this is what I've done. He said, you don't play for clubs, you play for people. People get the best out of you. He said, get yourself up the road with Ron Atkinson and that's where you should be. And the minute I drove into um, Sheffield Wednesday, I come down Leppins Lane and I drove into she Sheffield Wednesday. I walked out on the pitch with Ron. I went to the hotel and I went out that night and I knew Sheffield was a place for me. And I, I, I've never moved. My, I, my, my, my Lucy now, who, who I'm married to, Stubbsy knows we, we've been together 18, 19 years. She's, she's from Sheffield. We've got our family home there. And it's just a lovely place to live and the people are passionate about football but they're also good people I just 
it was just the right move for me to do. And, and I had a fantastic time there, both on and off the pitch. Hey, I live I, I lived to the northwest. I was uh, on the other side of the, of the Pennines, right? And uh, I, I can agree, when you go to Yorkshire, it's uh, it's different, you know. It is just one hell of a place, you know. And they are they are mad, mad supporters, or whatever or whatever sport they they support, they are mad, and they're they're so loyal to you know their home sides. And then they give everyone else so much stick. Let me tell you, it's, it's unbelievable going over there. So it's a different planet, Yorkshire, full of great people, though, like the Northwest. Carlton, tell me about leading out. Wednesday for an FA Cup final. You spoke about your England career with great passion. Leading a team out for an FA Cup final. Um, surely, the, a club level, that surely must be a massive honour. Yeah, it was. I mean, obviously, you know, to play an FA Cup final, anyhow, there's a, many a great player who hasn't done that. And yeah. I've been lucky, you know, to go to Wembley on a few, you know, several occasions to play. And get, then to lead your the club out that you that you, you love and whatever. And, you know, I, I honestly believe that that night we would, we would lift the, the trophy. And, in, 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 you know, that would have just capped it off completely, you know. Um, and I don't think any Arsenal player who played in the FA Cup final in 93 or any Arsenal supporter would argue that we were the best aside in the FA Cup final and deserved to win that. They were, without doubt, in the Carling mm. Club, we got to the Carling Club and the FA Cup in both that season. Without doubt, the Carling Club, they edged that. But on the, in the FA Cup on the Saturday, we should have beat them. On the replay, when I captained them on the Tuesday, I mean, it was, going, it was 90 seconds from going to penalties. You know, and Woodsy made a decision to, you know, which is a decision you make as a goalkeeper. Do you tip it over or do a catch it? And it's time. You know, it was one of those things. Um, um, so, yeah, it was, it, was, it, it, was a, it was a very special moment to, to catch it. It's a great in a, place. In it's a great Cup place. Fight. And it, when, you, when you walk up that old Wembley change room and you walk out and walk up that tunnel and you, and you can't see anyone and then the noise just explodes. That's, that's a very oh. special feeling, isn't it, Carlton? Oh, it's unbelievable. Unbelievable. And, uh, you know, Jesus, the noise. I mean, the FA Cup final, I think on, on that day, was 77,000 in the stadium, yeah. which is just phenomenal, you know? Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to You know what I haven't done? And I'm, I'm looking forward to doing this when I retire. Because I'm always so, so busy, I haven't looked back at any of these games and those, those times. Do you know what I mean? It, 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 I've, just, I've just not had the time. And at the time, as, as you know, Jonathan, when you're involved in big games, and the top player, as soon as you get onto the football pitch, you switch on. And, that, and yeah. that's all I'm concerned about is the game. Yeah. Who's, who's the best player? Who's the best player you've played with and against? The best player I've played with is... It's difficult now because it's it's hard to name one player without a, without a shadow of doubt at, at, at club level. I would have to say it's it, it would be Chris Waddle at international level. I would have to say Pascal. Yeah, I can imagine you and Gaz are getting on very well. Actually, <laughs> we did get on well. I was his minder, both on and off the pitch. <laughs> It's good. That's good. I, 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 that's reminding me. Have you seen that? Um, you need top players need um, you know minders. Have you seen that program called Ice Guardians? It's on Netflix, and it's exactly the same. It says oh. it's all about. You got to watch it. It's about all the superstars, right? Like the main, the main one was Wayne Gretzky. He had he had a guardian, and if the the, the hard man from the other side had to get the Gretzky. They had to get through the hard man first. It's a documentary on Netflix, right? Ice Guardians. It's a brilliant programme. You've got to watch it, right? And it's just all about minders looking after people. It's, it's brilliant. Carlton, just give us a little bit of a pen portrait of some of the guys you're playing alongside, please. Because you've played a lot of international football, I would say, alongside Des Walker, David Platt, Wrighty, Paul Merson. Um, that generation of player. Can you just give us a bit of a pen portrait of being uh, alongside alongside some of those people, please, on and off the pitch? Well, you've got you've got big H in goal, Dave Seaman, 
Um, it, it, him and Chris Woods were vying, the goalkeeper at Sheffield Wednesday. Dave Seaman, both of them were phenomenal goalkeepers. Phenomenal goalkeepers. David Seaman. i seen David Seaman make probably the best save I've ever seen live against Sheffield United in the uh, FA Cup at Sheffield United. He was an unbelievable keeper. Um, Tony Adams, um, I, I, huge admiration for Tony Adams. You know, like centre-backs who lack a bit of pace, always keep their full-backs in, not Tony Adams, always telling his full-backs, your job is to stop crosses coming in. If the ball's in the space, that's my job. Huge admiration for him. The two full-backs, Lee Dixon, arguably the best uh, attacking full-back uh, of that generation. Uh, Stuart Pearce, well, there's not much you can say about Stuart Pearce. I mean, he's, he's unbelievable. He's an unbelievable left foot. Um, Platy, Platy was Johnny on the spot. He'll always score goals for you. Des Walker, in my opinion, was probably at one point the best centre-back in the world. Without a shadow of doubt. I think what happened with Des when he went to, I think he was led up the garden path a little bit when he went to Sampdoria and they played him at left fullback. But, and that, he lost his way a little bit there. But without a shadow of doubt, he was one of the best uh, centre backs in the world at one point. Ian Wright, I don't think Wrighty ever eclipsed what he did for his club that, for England. I mean, he was a phenomenal um, goal scorer for Arsenal. Phenomenal player. And I don't think he quite was able to do that for England. I don't know why, but maybe it's the familiarity of playing with players week in or week out. But he was a phenomenal player. I mean, I remember playing him against uh, when I was at Leeds United. And I remember him saying to me, walking off the pitch at half time, and I, I got him locked, stock and barrel. He's not had a kick. He's not had a kick. And he just nudges me as he's walking off. And he says to me, you know, I'm going to score the winner. That's what and <laughs> He did. And second half, he did. He did nothing in the game. Dink him right, left, boom, dink the keeper. Unbelievable guy. But he never really re re rediscovered that for England. But he was a phenomenal player. Les Ferdinand, terrific bloke. One of the yeah. nicest blokes I've ever met in football. One of the nicest blokes. Terrific footballer. Uh, Gascoigne needs no, uh, you know, I mean, if Gascoigne doesn't do his knee, um, there, oh, you, you didn't really get to see the best of Paul Gascoigne because of that injury. If, if he didn't do his knee at that point when he went to Lazio, Jesus, I mean, he, he got everything. Gazza has, if you look at the, the three players in the world who do this, and there's only three Gascoigne, Messi, and Ronaldo, when they pick the ball up, they run quicker with the ball than without the ball. That is an art in itself, it's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. Just watch Messi today when he picks the ball up. His acceleration with the ball is phenomenal. And Gaza had that. Gaza had that in abundance with his, his vision and whatever. I mean, I was looking, Peter Beardsley was a talented player. Um, Chris Waddle, as I said, when Chris Waddle came to Sheffield Wednesday, 38, I think he won Sports Writers Player of the Year, Players Player of the Year. He was absolutely phenomenal. Phenomenal. And I remember, funny, we're talking about Chris Waddle. We're playing uh, West Ham and uh, they were shouting, show him down his right-hand side. He ain't got a right foot. Show him down his right-hand side. Steps over on his right-hand side and put it in the opposite corner stanch. Could go either side, Chris. Could go either side. So is it impossible to play? Because when he plays on that right-hand side, you don't want to let him open it up because he can hit diagonal balls across the pitch or spot the forward in. It, 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 he's a nightmare to mark. And if, he double, if you double tag him, he's got the ability and knowledge to let the ball go quickly to open up the space on the other side. So then, you know, and you look at the players I played, Mark Hughes played with Mark at Southampton, tremendous pro, you know, tremendous player in his time. You know, Matt Letizia, I know people think me and Matt have had a spat. I had a spat with Matt because I needed to get him going. When he got going, he nearly got back in the England side. You know, but he was a talented player. Very, very talented player. Uh, Carlton, how's life in China? Well, I've got to be honest with you. We love Shanghai. And the only thing that's been a bit disappointing for Lucy and I, we can't get back to see. We've got four kids and two grandkids and, and our parents. So... We, we can't get back at the moment and it's looking like it'll probably be next summer before they open the borders here. So it's disappointing. 
But apart from that, it, it's great here, Ray. Honestly, I mean, living in Shanghai, it's, you know, the... It, it's like living in London or New York. It's a big city, but we enjoy our work. We enjoy the lifestyle on the weekends and whatever. It, it's fantastic. And normally, we get home every 12 weeks. So this is a, a little bit of a problem, especially for the missus. It's a problem. Yeah. Do you feel Have you picked safe? a little bit of the lingo up? Sorry? Have you picked a little bit of the language up? Yeah, yeah, I can speak a little bit. I'm not great. I, well, I was here a year before Lucy got here and she said, what have you learnt? I said, Salah Ipe. She says, what's that? I said, one more. <laughs> one more bottle. <laughs> it's essentials, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah um, that's all right. Uh, t t time has beaten us. Grateful thanks to Kerry London for sponsoring this new series of Jiffy and Stubbsy. Carlton, thank you for joining us today. And I'm afraid it's your own fault. So entertaining. You're going to have to come back and join us again because I've really enjoyed the last 45 minutes. Yeah. That would be my pleasure. My pleasure. Good to see you all. Look after yourselves and stay safe. Say and goodbye. You. Say goodbye. Give us a goodbye <laughs> greeting in Chinese. Not a greeting. Wang Give us a goodbye in Chinese. Wang Shan Ha. That means good night. And thanks for listening to Jiffy and Stubbsy. Hope you'll join us again. Please hit the subscribe button.